Hello again and welcome to another Warhammer 40k Morning Glory video. In today's episode, we shall be doing another after action report. That's right, it's time for some more dispatches from the front lines. And oh baby, do I have a spicy meatball for you guys today. Anyone who is a treadhead is going to want to watch this video because I decided that it was finally time to take the armored company into the tournament scene. And I don't want to give too much away, but all I'm going to say is what I cannot crush with words, I shall crush with the tanks of the Imperial Guard. And with that said, let's not mess around any further. Let's crack on with today's video. Let's mount up, roll out, and drive right into today's episode. As is tradition, I want to start off by saying a big thank you to the tour organizers, and in this case, also the venue and the host for the event, if you've watched a few of my tournament reports, you will be intimately familiar with Just Play at this point. I have been to a lot of their events over the last few months, and there's a good reason for that. They're always really well run, and this one was no exception. From the timings, to the pairings, to the list, to the general organization, everything went really, really smoothly. And even though it was a relatively small 18 player tournament there were actually two tos on throughout the day so there was always someone there ready to help you if there were any rules queries or disputes that came up on the table and i also want to say a big thank you to all of my opponents for the day rich matt and jack every single one of them was a true gent there were no issues throughout the games and overall the games were just brilliant and fun but with all of that said, now let's get into the video proper and we'll begin with a brief list overview. Now, this is just going to be a quick run through of the army. As per usual, if you want to see the full deep dive and step by step thought process of the list, then that will be covered in a separate video and you'll be able to find a link to that down in the description below. So there were a couple of conditions, self-imposed restrictions that I put on myself whilst building this army. Firstly, everything had to be a vehicle. It had to be a vehicle that could essentially operate under its own power. So there was to be no transports, no infantry, no one that didn't have tracks and couldn't essentially be self-propelled. I also wanted this to be a traditional armoured company with between 10 and 12 vehicles with the aim to try and get 12 to really enjoy that armour overwhelming superiority and I wanted to focus on the Lehman Russ. Rogel Dawn is a fantastic tank. I've used it in many torn reports and many battle reports, and truly I think it is one of the best vehicles in the entire game right now. Not just in the Imperial Guard but I haven't really given as much time and thought to the Lehman Russ. And what I want to do with this list and with this event is to really get my fingers into the brain of the Russ. Really start to get a feel for how this unit operates in 10th. And can it stand alone on its merits? I also wanted to try out a wide variety of Lehman Russes. Not just stick with the same demolisher pattern or the same exterminator. Take a big smorgasbord of Russes so then I could see how they perform next to each other. So with those stipulations in place, the overall list was three Lehman Russ tank commanders. First one had a demolisher cannon, a las cannon, and two plasma cannons. Of course, every tank is rocking a heavy stubber and a hunter killer. I then had two more tank commanders, both in the El Classico configuration with battle cannon, a las cannon, heavy bolters, and one of them I had upgraded to Grand Strategist so he could do two orders. So in total, I had four tank orders with this army. I then had a Lehman Russ battle tank, also in the El Clasico configuration, and two Lehman Russ exterminators. These had heavy bolts in the front and multi-melters on the side. These were going to be quite important to the army because if you've noticed, I've got quite a few like battle cannons and there's a few heavy boulders around here. So having the extra AP from Withering Hail is going to make a big difference. And then rounding out the Lehman Russ side of the tank force, 
I had two Vanquishers. Now, Vanquishers are widely considered to be terrible. They have a very powerful gun, but they only hit on fours. You have to stay still for them to hit on threes because they do have heavy but staying still often means you're not able to move on to objectives and stuff like that. I often say movement wins games. So any ability that kind of relies on you staying still, especially with a direct damage unit, especially with lots of lines of blocking terrain, it just often isn't an option or isn't the best choice. But I took two vanquishers because they are terrible on paper, but I want to see how they would perform on the tabletop. And also they are very cheap. They're only 155 points. And at that price point, I'm almost happy to consider that I'm paying 155 points for the Lehman Russ profile with the two plus save and the wounds and the toughness. And then I'm getting the Laz Cannon, the Plasma Cannons, the Heavy Stubber and the Hunter Killer Missile. I'm paying for that. And essentially that Vanquisher Cannon is free. I don't want to play my hand too early, but I do want to get you guys hyped up with some foreshadowing. All I'm going to say is, the Vanquishers were nowhere near as bad as I thought they were going to be. So in total, that is eight Lehman Russes. But we wanted to have some support vehicles here as well. So we had three artillery pieces, two basilisks and a manticore. The manticore was there to have some sweet, sweet out of line of sight, damage three goodness, just slapping down anyone that's trying to hide behind a ruin who might have quite a lot of wounds. And the basilisks were there to do a bit of damage, but mostly to mess with my opponent's movement thanks to their amazing Earthshaker shape. Shells. The last vehicle in the convoy was a Hydra. I took this for two reasons. One, I think Hydras are a great cheap way of rounding out a motor pool. They're only 95 points. In many ways, they can be considered a budget exterminator. They do have the same strength and AP and damage. And if you come across anything with fly, then you're wounding it on twos with twin link. So I took it because I've been hypothesizing about the Hydra for a while. Now it's time to put it into a competitive list. And the other reason was fluff. I thought if you're going to have a tank column, driving down some roads. You're going to need some kind of anti-air, some sort of air cover in case someone wants to do like a strafing run. So it was a little bit fluffy and a little bit to satisfy my own curiosity. But that covers the list. Now let's get into the lay of the land. It was a one day, three round RTT. And it was overall, I would say, competitive. It wasn't a shark tank. Every player wasn't there gunning for first place but it wasn't semi-competitive or casual. It was just straight down the middle, competitive. There were about four or five players there who were very good, who I recognized, some of which were tournament winners, both locally and also on a bigger scale as well. And there were about a third of the players there that were kind of like me, been to a few tournaments, but they're just running the list that they enjoy running. And then there were about a third of the players who maybe it was their first tournament, maybe their second tournament, but they were all experienced at 40k. There was no one there that was essentially rocking up with two halves of a start set smashed together, trying to make it work. Everyone had a proper list. Everyone was playing well. Uh, it was just a really straight down the middle, classic RTT. As for the terrain, Just Play does not use WTC or UKTC terrain maps. They actually have their own ones that they have built and developed. And I quite like them. I think that they're a really good mixture of ruins and other terrain types. Often they have about 60% of the terrain being ruins, which is enough for each player to comfortably hide their army to help mitigate the risk of alpha strikes. And they've also got a couple of bits of big landslide blocking terrain in the middle of each board, so it's not just a shooting fest. But they do have some open areas as well, although these open areas are covered by forests. That means that either you're hidden or you're getting the benefit of cover. It means that shooting armies can actually shoot, big units can actually move around. This is one of the few places that I can take a super heavy two and actually have a chance of moving it and not just getting stuck in my deployment zone. But there's just enough terrain where combat armies can hop from ruin to ruin and they might have one turn when they've got to make a bit of a mad dash sprint, but they should be able to get there and get into combat without too much trouble. But that just about covers all of the pre-game stuff. Now let's get to the real reason you're all here, 
let's get into the game. So game number one can be tentatively described as a spicy start because I was going up against Rich and his Eldar. That's right. I'm taking my fluffy meme armored company, which I have had zero practice games with, up against what is still the buggy man, the Baba Yaga of the meta. Now, Rich had in his list a Farseer with the Phoenix gem, and then there was a Spirit Seer leading a big blob of 10 Wraith Guard. There was the Avatar of the Yanari, the Incarn, I believe it's called, and there was also three Hornets and three War Walkers, all with as many Bright Lancers as you can possibly cram onto them. There were two units of Warp Spiders, and there were also two units of Shadow Spectres. I'm not gonna lie, I went into this game pretty convinced that it was a foregone conclusion, and not in my favor. Not only am I up against an army that is vastly maneuverable, but also one that is packing a huge amount of anti-tank. There are 12 Bright Lances in this army, all of which can benefit from some form of Fate Dice or Reroll or some other thing. And then you've also got the Wraith Guard, which are another 10 very potent anti-tank weapons. Pretty much every weapon in my opponent's army is anti-tank. Even the bloody Warp Spiders, which have got Flamers. Their Flamers do devastating wounds, and the Shadow Spectres, they can do a Blast Shot, or they can do a Focus Beam, which is also half-decent anti-tank. But things only got more messed up when we saw the mission, which was Deploy Servo Skulls. I've not done this mission before, but it essentially boils down to taking the prime objectives in no man's land and kicking them like a football or soccer ball if you're transatlantic cousins and trying to kick them into the opponent's deployment zone. The closer you kick the objective to the opponent's deployment zone, the more points that you're able to get. We then come down to secondaries and I instinctively just go for tactical, of course. But Rich has a bit of a think and he decides to go for fixed objectives instead. He sees that I've got a crap load of tanks and he's got a lot of AT. So he thinks that bring it down will be an easy win. And then he also goes for deploy teleporter Homer because there's a very durable unit of Wraith Guard, which he can bring one back a turn with the spirits here and he can just plonk those in the middle of the board and just start deploying. It'll take me so long to chew through them that he's probably going to get that off multiple times. And on top of this, if I shoot the Wraith Guard, they get to shoot me back. So he could deploy the teleporter over in his turn and not really miss out on any firepower if I start shooting them. As for deployment, the Eldar essentially put all of their units behind L-shaped ruins in their deployment zone. Most of them concentrate on going for the middle objective, although there is a Hornet that goes over on the far left from the perspective of myself. As for my deployment, whilst I do my best to hide what units I can behind the L-shaped ruins, like my artillery, and to make sure the ones that I can't hide are in cover, I do decide to go Billy Big Bollocks. I decide to go aggressive. I decide that the only way I'm going to have a dog's chance in hell in this game is to completely overwhelm my opponent's anti-tank. Sure, he's got a lot of it. And maybe I'll lose two or three health, maybe even four tanks in the opening volley. But if I can put myself in a position where my remaining armor, because even if I lose four tanks, I'm still going to have eight left including like artillery and stuff. Even if I lose four Russes, I've still got four Russes left, right? So I decide that I'm going to go aggressive, full spearhead. I'm going to take the punch and then I'm going to punch back even harder. And if it all goes wrong, well, it doesn't matter. At least we gave it a go. And if I manage to get first turn, then thanks to things like move, 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 and the fact that Russes now go 10 inches and still shoot with no problems, I probably could get an angle or two where I could pick up an Eldar unit here, an Eldar unit there, and maybe even whittle down some of the anti-tank that I'm facing. And what would really help is that first turn, because the Eldar, they haven't got a huge amount of units. 
So if I'm able to take just one or two of them out, it might just give me a leg up where I can cling on and make something happen with this game. We roll the dice for first turn, and I roll a big fat one. And I literally burst out laughing. I can't stop myself. I'm like, oh, well, the one advantage that I needed and I don't get it. It's funny because Rich can't help smiling himself. He's not smiling in a horrible way. He's just, he knows that I really needed that first turn and I haven't got it. He rolls and he gets something normal like a four or five. And we head straight into Eldar turn one. With the initiative firmly in their grasp, the fast-moving Eldar zoom forward, bringing all of their anti-tank to bear. We've got War Walkers with Bright Lances coming down the right-hand side. We have got two Hornets coming down the center and a Hornet coming down the left. The Warp Spiders come over to the middle and start deploying the teleporter homer and holding that objective. And then you've got another war spiders that stays back a little bit. Obviously the shadow specters, I should say they were in reserve along with my Hydra. And really it was just 12 Bright Lances. That was the main star of the show here. Now 12 Bright Lances, pretty much hitting on threes with a reroll for every two Bright Lances. So the six rerolls there and a CP reroll and fate dice. That's a lot of damage, in theory. In reality, Rich did five damage. The Emperor protects, praise be to him on terror. Our faith was our shield and our faith was not found wanting. That's what happens when you put your faith in ancient technology. The Imperial Infantryman's uplifting primer states that Eldar technology is archaic and unreliable. And what more proof do you need? Okay, so memeing aside, there were a lot of factors that went into this. Firstly, all of my Lehman Russes were in cover, which meant that even with the AP minus three from the Bright Lances, I was on a four up. Secondly, I would say that Rich was a little cold on his dice and I was a little hot. It wasn't massive on either side, but it was just enough where it made a big difference. So, for example, Rich would roll his two shots for his Bright Lands. He'd get one hit, one miss. He would use his Eldar reroll to get the hit and then he'd roll to wound and he would fail one wound and he wouldn't have cp reroll or he wouldn't want to use it there or he'd already had used it where he wouldn't then get it it would then come over to me when i've taken one wound and i would just pass the four up because it's a 50 50 and sometimes when you're shooting at an army which is on a four up save we've all found this when you face like custodies or some other army that has an army wide four percent vulnerable save sometimes they just make those four up again and again and again and sometimes they make none of them and it never seems to be that a four-up is ever 50-50. Over the course of the game, it might be, but it seems to swing massively from one turn to the other. I think another thing which made a big difference was me popping smoke. Rich's Hornets could only see one Vanquisher, but his War Walkers could see both Vanquishers. And so he fired his War Walkers first, and he targeted the one that the Hornets could also see. So I just popped smoke on that one. And it meant that a lot of the Eldar Bright Lances were coming in and they were only hitting on fours at that point. And sometimes 50-50 is good for you, as we've just said with the saves, but sometimes you can't get that four up to save your life. You ask any guard player what it's like hitting on Ballistic Skill 4+, Plus, it's an absolute nightmare. And I think what this whole situation kind of showed was the fallibility of one-shot weapons and it was kind of similar to how i imagine a lot of like dark eldar players feel these days when they're like spamming as many dark lances as they can but you're still relying innately on one shot performing statistically and anyone who's played 40k for a long time will tell you one-shot weapons always let you down at the worst possible time and in this case all of rich's one-shot weapons let him down after the final bright lance shot was fired and I was able to stop it from doing any damage by using a CP reroll. Rich looked at me in the eyes and said, yeah, that's game. I was in disbelief. I just thought he'd had like one bad turn, but he'd be able to, you know, obviously put it back. It's Eldar. They've always got something in the bank. But with the benefit of hindsight, I now see what Rich was seeing. 
which is he had gone all in. He had come all out. He'd exposed pretty much 90% of his army and he hadn't killed anything. Now, if he had killed just one of those tanks, then his Yin Khan, the Yanari avatar, would have teleported over into the middle of my lines and it would have just been running amok. And that thing is very, very durable. It would have absorbed all of my shooting for a turn and that would have meant his Bright Lances would have had another chance to start whittling through all of my armor. But as it was, he hadn't killed a vehicle. So his avatar couldn't teleport over there. It then comes over to the guard turn. I push forward with all of my tanks, with the left two tanks moving on to their objective, the right two tanks moving on their objective, and the still four tanks of the vanquishers and everything moving into the center. So now I've parked eight armored vehicles across the whole of no man's land. Lock those objectives down. Don't forget, each one of my Russes is three OC. So I've got like six OC minimum on each objective and he's only got a bunch of one OC like infantry, like warp spiders and there's a unit of rangers knocking about the place as well. So I actually out OC him in many cases as well. So I've parked on all of the objectives and then I open up. And Eldar units might have a lot of firepower and even with things like lightning fast reflexes making them mass one to hit, they can be pretty durable. But it was eight Lehman Russes of firepower. And with Take Aim knocking about the place as well, it was a bit of a slaughter. On the left, the Demolisher and the Exterminator pick up the Hornet facing them down. On the right, um, my Battle Tank and Tank Commander pick up a War Walker uh, each. And then there is one War Walker that is left over. And then in the center, I go to roll with my uh, Vanquishers. My Vanquishers, they didn't have take aim and I'd move with them. And what I do is I fire the first Vanquisher into one Hornet and I get the four to hit. I get the wound and I do 11 damage, just poof, straight through, just kill it. And the second Vanquisher goes and it also gets a four plus to hit. It gets the hit and it goes straight through. It's got the inbuilt reroll if it needs it for shooting vehicles, and it goes straight through, uh, and that one also does like 10 damage. So once the dust had settled, I had taken out 10 out of 12 Bright Lances on the field. And to make matters worse, I had used my artillery to slow down the Wraith Guard as well, as trim them down like a little bit. I think I killed like two or three of them in total because like the Manticore obviously is slapping that big black three damage through on them. Uh, and I'd also killed a unit of the Warp Spiders as well. So a huge amount of the Elder Army had just been cleared up in my first turn. And they had and they had gone first. It wasn't even like this was an Alpha Strike of my making. This was just my counter attack. To be brutally honest, if it hadn't been game at the end of Eldar turn one, it was pretty much game at the end of Guard turn one. Because having gone for fixed objectives, and one of those fixed objectives being bring it down, which relied upon killing enemy tanks, having lost the vast majority of their ranged anti-tank, the Eldar were just going to struggle to pick up points on that one. We ended up playing the game out and it actually was very, very close. Just a testament to what the Eldar can do and how you should never underestimate them. Um, over the course of Eldar turn two, they essentially moved in uh, with the Wraith Guard, even though they were slowed down, they were able to shoot a tank, destroying it, charging the tank, wrapping it up. Um, the Avatar came in and was able to kill a tank as well. In my turn two, uh, I was able to essentially kill the Avatar, although it did take nearly all of my firepower, but it did absorb the entire army's firepower, including the artillery as well. With the funny thing being, I had saved um, enough CP at this point to be able to use Fields of Fire. Uh, and so I had Fields of Fire and I had Withering Hail from an Exterminator on the Avatar. And the Avatar was on one wound after everything I shot it, including artillery. And I had one last tank to fire. And he fired like everything at it. And the Avatar was just making four up saves, fate dies, reels, making everything. And then I had a heavy stubber. 
the last shot in my army. And it was in rapid fire range and the tank had stayed still. I roll the dice and I get three sixes. They all auto wound because the tank has stayed still. They all get lethal hits. And then it just comes down to the save rolls. And one of the sub rounds managed to make it through because the avatar's on a four up save. It wasn't getting cover from where the tank was positioned. The avatar's on a four up save. I say the avatar again, I mean the, the encounter. The avatar of death, should we say. And uh, it fails one of those four ups. And the 50 cow, get on that 50! Someone get on that 50! It's mine! <laughs> The 50 cow just manages to bring it down and the avatar of death, the Incarn, was sent back into the abyss from whence it came. At that point, we then go over to Eldar turn three. Wraithguard are basically sat in the middle of the board. There's the Farseer with them as well. And the Farseer is able to uh, deploy teleporter Homer whilst the Wraithguard blasts a couple of tanks. Um, and they blast one, damage another, and then when I move, they use Overwatch and Fate Dice to get that second tank. So I'll probably lose about four tanks over the course of this game. Uh, three of them to the Wraith Guard. Just, that's a testament to how good they are. But then it is three turns of Guard Firepower just into what amounted to a Lone War Walker, a unit of Wraith Guard, and also a Farseer. And even the Farseer dying and getting back up again with the Phoenix Gem. Um, we get to the end of turn five, and I think that, uh, that's basically we table the Elder. I think there might be like one Wraith Guard and the Spirit Seer left because they've just been lightning fasting. Or oh, maybe you can't do it on the Wraith Guard, but they had been, they were in cover. The main objective was just in, in cover. So they were in cover, uh, and I was just hitting them with everything, but my dice rolls have cooled off a little bit, and the Eldars have picked up a little bit. And so the end of the game, the remaining Eldar units is just a handful of Wraith Guard in the middle of the board. I haven't lost any further tanks at this point, and the score becomes 58 to the Guard and 52 to the Eldar. You might be surprised by that relatively low score, but trust me, that tends to be the nature with deploy servo skulls when the objectives are constantly being kicked back and forth, even by small scraplet units, because all you need is to move someone on and then you can start kicking it back the other way. I think one of the big deciding factors here, even more so than the shenanigans turn one, was the fixed objectives that the Eldar took. I think by taking fixed objectives, they couldn't then fall back on just skirting around and scoring secondaries. And it got to a point where they couldn't physically get any more, bring it down. There wasn't the firepower to do it. And there had to be a choice between bring it down and then also deploy teleport homers when your units are starting to get reduced to just a handful of them. I think if the Eldar had gone tactical objectives, they still might have been able to pull out a win. At the very least, they might have got a draw because we were using WTC scoring. And so you have to beat your opponent by five or more points to actually get a win. And I only won by six points. But that just about sums up game one. A surprise victory for his Imperial Guard. The Emperor's true finest had crushed the perfidious Eldar beneath our iron tracks. But now it's time to move on. Let's take a look at game number two. In the second battle of the day, I faced off against Matt and his Blood Angels. Now, I want to say a big thank you to Matt, not only for being a brilliant person to play against, but also for being a supporter of the channel. It's always great to put a face to the name. So, Matt, thank you so much for being a supporter and thank you for being part of the community. Now, in Matt's army list, he had a Phobos Librarian leading a squad of Eliminators, which made them loan operative. He had, I think it was a Primaris Lieutenant. It might have been a Captain. Either one leading a big squad of the new Primaris Flamer Marines. And when I say a big squad, I mean a big 10-man squad. And they were inside a Repulsor. There was also a Ballistus Dreadnought and a Redemptor Dreadnought. Uh, and then there were two units of, I want to say, Infiltrators. They might have been in Curses, but they were units that could infiltrate forward and they had the regular bolters and the twinned combat blades. Then there were five intercessors, 
and there was a lone operative lieutenant as well. There were five death company with jump packs with thunder hammers led by a death company chaplain. And there were two units of the jumpy dudes, the primaris jump pack guys, which have the twin plasma pistols. Finally, there was a big unit of eradicators the melter guys and they were accompanied by an apothecary biologist the new one that came out with 10th edition the mission for game two was the ritual and i have to say this is a very confusing mission matt and i had to read it again and again and again to try and understand how this thing actually works and i'm gonna be honest i'm not sure that i ever fully got it so again another thank you to matt for actually holding my hand and taking me through it. Fortunately, he had played it before. Uh, in terms of secondaries, both of us went for tactical missions, and then the deployment was search and destroy, essentially table quarters. Speaking of deployment, I essentially went for the same strategy as last time. Had a couple of tanks go down the right, tank command with battle cannon, also the battle tank. Couple of tanks go down the left. Again, demolisher, the exterminator. It worked well, might as well do it again. And then down the middle, we had the two vanquishers, an exterminator, and the final battle tank commander with the grand strategist. And all of the artillery went behind the big L-shaped ruin that was in my deployment zone most of the vehicles i had were hidden out of line of sight although again both vanquishers really just got front lined and i wasn't too worried because there wasn't a huge amount of ranged anti-tank long range anti-tank in matt's list you had the ballista's dreadnought the repulsor has a decent amount of daca but not a lot of it is anti-tank and then you've got the redemptor with the, the plasma cannon but the flamer dudes who could all do devastating wounds by the way matt's detachment was the firestorm detachment which i actually thought was really cool gives everyone assault weapons so you can move and advance and still shoot which is tasty but apart from the, the apart from those vehicles a lot of the anti-tank was the jumpy dudes dropping in with the plasma the eradicators with their melters which is inevitably short range and also the flamer guys which can do a lot of devastating which is also short ranged i figured if matt got first turn then i might lose a tank or two but i'd still have six lehman russes to rock and cock with and the two tanks i was likely to lose were going to be the vanquishers which are in many ways the most disposable tanks in my army as for the Blood Angels, we had the Infiltrating Marines and the Lone Wolf Lieutenant infiltrate into the middle of the board behind an L-shaped ruin. We had the Intercessors go onto the left-hand side of the deployment zone, again, from my perspective. And then there was a bit of an armored column. The Repulsor was at the front. It was in line of sight, but it was behind cover. And then behind that, you had the Blister's Dreadnought. And then behind that, you had the Redemptor. And then taking shelter behind the huge line of sight blocking L-shaped ruin that was a feature of both players' deployment zones. You had the Eliminators with the Phobos Librarian, which made them lone operative. And then you had the big melter dudes as well with the Biologus Apothecary. In reserve, I put my Hydra, and in reserve, the Blood Angels had the Jumpy Dudes of Plasma and the Death Company. We roll off to see who gets the first turn, and huzzah! The Imperial Guard sees the initiative, and we get to go first for a change. I never seem to go first. I draw my secondaries, and I get two that are eminently doable. I get Cleanse and Secure No Man's Land. And then we go over to the movement. I push my tanks forward. I only really have line of sight on the Repulsor, but hey, I might as well take that out and at least start getting some armor domination on the field. I start off with the Exterminator in the middle, and that peppers up the Repulsor. And this is where I learned that Repulsors only have like a three up save, which is surprisingly bad for a tank that chunky. I just presumed they had a two up, but nope, they only had a three up save. Because of this, the Exterminator, with it being in rapid fire range and with it having twin linked and with it having take aim, was able to actually uh, sneak a wound past with its exterminator autocannon. I'm also able to get one past with the heavy bolter, of all things. So I end up doing five wounds to the repulsor. I thought that's pretty good. 
But then I think, you know, I then decide to go with one of the Vanquishers. I haven't got particularly high hopes. I haven't even put take aim on this thing. But I think if I can chip off a couple of wounds, then the tank commander that's also over there might be able to finish it. I've only got the one Vanquisher fine because the other one is doing cleanse on the middle objective. I fire the Vanquisher and I get a four to hit. Brilliant. I then roll to wound and I get the wound. Nice. Uh, Matt says, what's the AP? And I say, oh, it's AP minus five because the exterminator shot it first. It hit with its auto cannon. Withering hail went off. So it's AP five. Even with being in cover, the repulsor doesn't get a save because it's only save three plus. The Vanquisher round goes straight through. I roll my damage and I roll a big bat six i do 12 damage in one go to the repulsor and destroy it the vanquisher after being lined up by the exterminator literally goes one shot one kill and puts a hyper velocity round through the front of the primaris vehicle and out of the back I'm telling you boys, as long as you can guarantee that you're going to roll a 4+, plus, Vanquishers are OP, apparently. <laughs> Imagine if Guard had, like, Miracle Dice or Fate Dice, and whenever you were shooting a Vanquisher, you could just go, oh, I'll just make sure that hits. Whoa. Heady days, boys. That would be the dream come true, right? But as it is, the Vanquisher round does take out the Repulsor. Unfortunately for the Marines... Clearly, it touches off some ammunition or it causes the reactor core to go critical because the repulsor does actually explode. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is where I learned that repulsors do a big explosion. It is a D6 deadly demise. And unfortunately for Matt, Nearly every unit in his army was in range of this repulsor. Because it's such a big model, and he put it in the middle of his deployment zone. It was front line, but it was in the middle of his army. Everything else is within range of the deadly demise. And Matt proceeds to roll one of the most devastating explosions I have ever seen. This guy rolled a five or a six on nearly every single unit. The Ballista's Dreadnought takes five wounds. The Intercessors take six wounds. One of the units of other infantry that was nearby takes five wounds. But the really big deal was the Eliminators. They took six wounds, which killed the entire unit. And this meant that the Phobos Librarian, because he was no longer leading a squad was no longer lone operative i don't know how much damage that explosion did but i feel like matt easily did easily once the dust had settled 25 to 30 wounds to his own army with his own explosion to rub salt in the wound the flame unit inside lost a couple of guys jumping out and the only place that they could deploy because you can't have your unit set up halfway through a ruined wall you've got to be either wholly on one side of the wall or wholly on the other right you kind of models that are like morphing part way through not everyone's like a necron with a phase shifter the only place that they could disembark because of this was right out the front but that meant that some of my other tanks could see them. So the Demolisher Tank Commander proceeds to unleash into them. And between the Plasma Cannon Blast and the Demolisher Cannon Rolling Hot, every single one of those Flame Marines disappears in a huge Demolisher explosion. And then, to make things even worse, if it couldn't get any worse, but it, then it did, because the Repulse was now gone and it it's block had physically been blocking line of sight to the Ballista's Dreadnought behind it and the Ballista's Dreadnought has taken a huge amount of damage I can then use my tank commander who was the one that I'd, I originally planned to finish off the repulse with he could then see the Ballista's Dreadnought 
and he manages to kill it because it's only got about four wounds left because it's taken so many. Four, it's either four or six wounds because it's taken so many from the explosion. And it proceeds to die. And so in one go, the Marine Army, I think we calculated this afterwards, lost about 700 points, if not more, from what was essentially just an exterminator, a vanquisher, an explosion, and a couple of follow-up shots. It was the most horrific set of circumstances, chain reaction, and series of events that I have seen in any game of 40k. It's any game of 10th edition, and it is one of the most devastating openers I have seen anyone be on the receiving end of in nearly my entire decade of playing this game competitively. Frankly, there is no way to sugarcoat this. That was game. Because I'd only fired 33% of my tanks. I'd fired 4 out of 12. Okay, sure, the Hydra is off the map, but I've still got a whole bunch more firepower. I've still got all of my artillery to go. And the artillery proceeds to slow down the eradicators, so they're not going anywhere. And then I also pick up the Phobos Librarian, because he's now not loan up with another basilisk and then the manticore just starts flattening what remnants of infantry are left over but through all of this matt was an absolute gem he was just laughing at the ridiculousness of the situation he explained to me that he always rolls either very cold or very hot and it's always in the worst possible way like this is not the first time something like this has happened to him he is infamous for it within his friend group and he could have been so tilted he could have rage quit so hard i probably would have been quite grumpy about that if i'd been on the receiving end of it but he genuinely just laughed it off and I think that deserves huge props because this could have been a very awkward, very difficult game. And thanks to Matt, it was actually one of the most fun games I had of the day. We still played the game out. I mean, hell, we were having a laugh and we had the time to kill, so why not? Marine turned two to make Maz even worse somehow. They drew two cards that they couldn't score and then they tried to move what infantry around that they could but the eradicators their one bit of anti-tank was being slowed down by the basilisk they were only going like three or four inches a turn um, even with the advance they only rolled like a one or a two so they didn't get any further and then over the course of my turn two i just killed everything that i could see the artillery was pounding the eradicators uh marine turn two their reserves came down and uh, they were actually able to kill the hydra which i had brought in turn two to do an objective so they didn't get completely whitewashed they got some points and they also were able to get a kill but unfortunately by the end of guard turn three i did manage to pick up the remaining marine units i was just being completely aggressive I, all of my tanks were rolling forward because at this point there was no real anti-tank threat the eradicators had been pounded by artillery for the first two turns and then uh, the remaining marine units had had to expose themselves to get what points they could. And so we end up cleaning up the board by the end of turn three, having lost just a single Hydra. Unsurprisingly, the Guard were able to achieve a massive victory, getting 100 victory points to the Blood Angels 28, giving me a 20 nil under the WTC scoring. Honestly, that is the most one-sided game I have had of 10th edition. And I think it all came down to that explosion. If the Repulsor hadn't just cooked off, I think that even if the Marines had lost it, they would have been able to play it KG and they had enough close range anti-tank where they could have started jumping out with one unit at a time, like taking one tank out and sort of carving away an armoured asset at a time whilst also being able to effectively move block and tie up some of the guard vehicles as well. Because we've got a lot of blast, so it can make it tricky for us to actually get um, the shots off. But with that explosion, unfortunately, the fate of the blood angels was sealed and i did joke with matt afterwards that if his luck is always like this he absolutely needs to repaint his blood angels to a lamenter's color scheme but with a blistering second game out of the way it is now time for us to head into the 
final battle of the tournament. Game three was against Jack and his World Eaters. And when I saw this pairing, I was really excited for the game. Jack is a regular of the Just Play tournaments, and he's a pretty good player as well. I've seen him podium more often than I can remember, and he's even taken a few event wins as well. But the funny thing is that despite the fact that I've been to almost half a dozen Just Play events this year, we've never actually paired up against each other. And so finally, the dice gods, the gods of fate, had decided that we were gonna get that matchup. Normally, Jack runs his Tyranids, but he's not been feeling them recently because even though they can do lots of tricks and stuff, they don't do a lot of damage. So he switched over to World Eats. It's the first tournament I've seen him run them because they're a lot more aggressive and a lot more killy. In his list, he had a Lord on a Juggernaut, and then he had the big man himself, Angron, of course. There was a Lord Executioner too, leading a squad of five Berserkers. There were three other five-man Berserker units as well, uh, a unit of Jackals, two Rhinos, and three squads of Exalted Eightbound. Now, the mission was Sites of Power, which is a pretty standard 10th edition mission. You just get more points if you're able to get characters onto the objectives in No Man's Land. This was combined with Scrambler Fields for the twist, making deep striking a little bit tricky, but neither side had deep striking this time. And the deployment was Crucible of Battle. However, the big deal here was the terrain. It was surprisingly dense with very limited firing lanes. In fact, there was only really two firing lanes in the entire board. The rest of it was lots and lots of ruins that are on bases, and these bases are impossible for you to see across using the new 10th edition terrain rules. The effect of this was my firepower would be much more limited and Jack's ability to get his world eaters up the board safely was increased. But then we get to deployment. I put my Hydra in reserve, Jack puts a unit of eight round in reserve and we start chucking units onto the board. I place down a few of my more sacrificial units first and I'm not afraid to front line them. I know that the world eaters can come at me hard and fast but I'm pretty tough and I also don't mind if they want to come all in because if they do, I kind of do what I did in game one and take the punch and then blow them back. I also really need to know where Angron is going. Whichever flank he decides to materialize on is an area that's going to be very difficult for me to manage. I end up placing down a few tanks and Jack has to put down Angon as his last drop and he drops last and I still have a couple more units to go down. Angon ends up going over on the left flank from my perspective. There is a big debate and Jack ums and ahs whether to front line him or to be a bit more cagey with him. If he front lines him and gets first turn he can guarantee a turn one charge between the blood tithe and the other bits. But if he doesn't get first turn, there is a very, very strong possibility I am going to be able to pick Angron up turn one. Because I've got two Vanquishers that can just draw line of sight to him. So they can just stay still. They can have heavy. Sure, he's got a four up in them, but one of those Vanquishers gets through. That's half his wounds gone there. And then I've also got my Exterminators and I've got my artillery. I've just got so much that could that either see him without moving or could move and see Angron relatively easily. But I respect Jack for this. He decides to go Billy Big Bollocks. He decides to embrace Corn. If he hides, sure, Angron will be safe, but Angron won't be doing anything. If he puts Angron out there, he might die, but he can always bring him back with the Blood Tithe and... If he gets that first turn, it'll be really, really big. We roll off to see who gets the first turn. And just like in game one, I roll a big fat one. Oh my God, <laughs> I roll so badly. Jack rolls uh, whatever isn't a one and he does proceed to get the first turn. Angron goes zooming across the board, doesn't mess around, and he gets that turn one charge. It is only into a Vanquisher, but he gets the turn one charge. He kills the Vanquisher, and straight away, Angron is in my face turn one. 
As for the rest of Jack's army, it moves and advances and it's pretty cagey. Uh, and he gets like jackals onto like the middle objective and he gets eight bound sort of behind an L-shape near the middle objective. He's got another unit of eight bound that push forward. He, he's actually pretty aggressive with his units, but he's being very careful and being very cagey with what can actually see him. It might seem like he goes all in with lots of, but actually he doesn't. Like I can't see his jackals really. And I can't see one of the eight bound units, even though it's scout moved and all. I think it just moved forward. I can't see those two units. The only unit outside of Angon that I can really see is one unit of eight bound. Comes over to guard turn one. And my plan is simple. I need to push forward on the right while staying still on the left and the center. So I can pour as much firepower into the big angry red dude as possible. I start opening up. But because of how dense the terrain is here, Angron is getting the benefit of cover. And so my exterminators are only AP minus one. So Angron is still on his two up saves. So even there's a load of flat damage three in the army. The problem that I'm having is that the exterminators are only AP one. So the first one that fires at him doesn't do any damage. It just hits him. And the wounds with the multi-melters either don't materialize because they're only strength nine or I get one or two wounds through, at which point Jack makes his four saves. He's getting quite good with his demon saves. I do think it did help that every time he rolled a demon save, he went, DEMON SAVE! And I think the Chaos Gods quite enjoyed that. <laughs> so the first uh, exterminator doesn't do anything. It just sets up. Uh, but even then, when I'm piling in like the second exterminator and then like the battle tank, I'm still only putting him down to like a three up save and again Angron is like toughness 11 so the wounds just aren't really materializing and I'm having a big problem where every time I roll a random shot uh for random shots for my my boom boom guns like my battle cannons and stuff I'm rolling like a one or a two I don't roll above a three on the random number of shots with my tanks this game not this turn this game uh, the artillery was fine. The artillery tended to do okay, but the main tanks were consistently rolling ones and twos, and I think occasionally I was lucky to get, like, a three. So between me not really having as many shots, those shots struggling to get past a two-up or three-up save, and whenever I do manage to put him onto his four-up, that kind of going off, Angon is just not taking anywhere near as much damage as I need him to. Bear in mind as well that I've stayed still with a lot of these units. I've sacrificed my mobility to get lethal hits and those are just not materializing. I'm not getting any lethals on the melters or the plasma or the last cans. None of that's going off. Where I am getting lethal hits is with things like stubbers, but stubbers are AP one with like withering hail, but Angon's in cover, so they're AP none. After firing the majority of my main battle tanks and tank commanders at Angrom, he's down to six wounds. I have the Vanquisher left, and for the first time in the tournament, the Vanquisher opens up and misses. Big sad. I even use a CP reroll to like reroll it and it still misses, <laughs> which was really sad because I really wanted that to get the hit because if it had done, it then gets to reroll wounds against monsters and vehicles and maybe, maybe it would have got past the four up. Jack had used his uh, invulnerable save, I mean his CP reroll at this point, so yeah, maybe it would have been, but the Vanquisher let me down. I then had a really difficult decision to make with my artillery. Um, one of the artillery pieces was investigating uh, a signal, um, so I wanted to uh, do that so I could actually get some points. Uh, but I had my two bazers left over, and they could see Angron, and they did. Uh, they did have take aim on them as well, so I could have just fired like directly into him, and maybe that would have killed him. But they've got the hunter killers and they've got the heavy bolters, so I figured what I'd do is I would fire my. Hunter Killers and Heavy Bolters at Angrom, and I'd fire the Earthshakers into the Jackals that were in the, uh, that were holding the middle of the board. And I don't know if this was the right call in the end. My thinking was, I don't want to get tunnel visioned onto Angrom. 
I want to make sure that I'm still limiting uh, Jack's ability to be getting like primary points and secondaries and stuff. Because if I put everything into Angron and he just comes back, I've basically wasted my first turn. So I want to put some of the casualties down. So both Basilisks end up doing that. I get plenty of hits and wounds. And the Basilisks, like Heavy Bolters, are like getting stainers and everything. And the Hunter Killers are like going off, but like getting the hit and they're not getting the wounds. Um, Angron doesn't take any damage, unfortunately, from the Accoutrement from the Basilisk. But the good news is, between the Basilisk rolling quite well um, and the fact that there's quite a lot of Jackals let, you know, in that squad, they are able to like blow the Jackals up. Uh, and I also had one of my tanks that couldn't see Angron that fired into a unit of 8 bound that also uh, killed them down to like one dude. So the end result is Angron is on 6 wounds and also uh, he's lost his jackals and he's basically lost like a unit of 8 bound as well. We go over to World Eater turn 2 and Angron is still alive and this becomes a problem immediately. He flies over to my artillery park and he is able to charge a Manticore and an Exterminate. He kills the Manticore, but I get a little lucky on my saves. I roll a couple of sixes, and the Exterminator actually lives on four wounds. It won't be able to fire this turn. It's going to have to fall back and shoot, but it does live. The World Eaters also send in the lone eight bound that had survived, and he goes in and gets an advance and a charge, and he actually manages to tie up another one of my tanks. And I just... Between like shooting into combat with him and trying to win him over, this is like a one wound eight bound that just survives again and again and again. He's an absolute beast. He's the giga bound. Um, and Jack also starts feeding me five berserkers at a time. And this is really important because world eaters get like sticky objectives. The jackals get sticky objectives. And I think that's something they can do where if a unit dies on an objective, they can also make it sticky. Um, so by feeding me like one unit of like berserkers at a time, over the course of like turn two and sort of like turn three, uh, he's stopping me from being able to move. And I would say this was a really, really clever thing uh, by Jack. He didn't go all in. He was just the right amount of aggressive. And he forced me to have to keep dealing with Angron whilst just movement blocking me. Because like I said, the terrain is very dense. So there's only a couple of channels that I can move down and it only takes like five berserkers. A Rhino, a single eight bound. That's all it takes, just little bits here and there. There's no need for him to overcommit, so he didn't. Turn two essentially consisted of me getting move blocked on uh, in the center and on the right, and Angron just rampaging around my back line. It comes over to turn two for the guard, and we are able to kill Angron. It does take way more than it should do though again that demon save is popping demon save just popping 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 but eventually angron does go down but sadly this gives me a lot less scope for clearing away some of his movement blocking and some of his chaff and crucially i make a big rules mistake i've been making this mistake since the beginning of 10th and so I want to apologize to everyone that I have wronged with this. I've done this in bow reports and no one's picked up on it. But it's not for them to pick up on it. It's my mistake. I'm owning that. Let's be clear here. I thought that one vehicle could shoot into combat with another vehicle with its non-blast weapons. I thought that basically a tank could like scratch the back of another tank. Turns out you can't do that. And so I made a huge mistake on my... Um, second turn where I didn't like fall back with a couple of units that I could have done even though one of them would have been like a desperate escape attempt because I figured well I might as well just stay in there and then just shoot in and, and clear away these berserkers that are blocking me here there's eight bands blocking me there but I couldn't do that so I ended up getting hugely movement blocked in my turn two and that really put me behind on the points because then I'm not taking these sticky primary objectives off the world eaters and at the same time I'm not clearing away so I'm now not only blocked turn two but I'm still going to be blocked turn three even with the world eaters not having to send that many more forces in to keep the wall up turn three for the world eaters comes round and Angron doesn't come back I'm not exactly sure how the mechanic works but the world eaters get a couple of opportunities to roll their blood tithe. I think they can like roll it at the end of your turn and then they can like maybe re-roll it and they can roll it in their turn. There's a couple of ways they can do it. But despite the fact that this must have been the second try for Angon to come back 
and then there's like a reroll involved, he still just didn't come back. This guy actually would have given me quite a big reprieve. But because of the move blocking that had happened turn two, the World Eater turn three is actually relatively calm. They just position themselves ready to just keep the movement block going and to keep, uh, just to wait for, for Angron to essentially come back. It comes over to guard turn three and I'm finally able to like clear out. I'm finally able to clear all, you know, the turn two, the turn three wall. So I'm like, yes, brilliant. I've finally, finally made it. We've broken through. All the eight bound are dead at this point. Um, uh, a unit of the Berserkers are dead as well. Angron's gone. The Jackals are gone. Finally, we can start rampaging across the open plains. Go over to World Eater, turn three, and turn four, I should say. And there's still 15 Berserkers in Rhinos. And so what happens is uh, I continue to get move block. There's also these like two Chaos Spawn that I forgot to mention this that also wouldn't die. And the Massive Executions actually comes in and takes out a tank as well. And I actually lose another tank from that had been like stuck in combat and had been like ground down. And so it comes over to like turn four for the guard. And by and large, I haven't been able to leave my deployment zone. And the World Eaters are down to the absolute dregs at this point. There's like one Rhino and like five Berserkers left over. By the time all of my turn four shooting goes off and I've you know, cleared another moving block. But, that, but that's it. It's turn four. The World Eaters might have lost like 95% of their army at this point, but I've just not got barely any primary. I've been struggling to score secondaries. I've lost like four tanks. It's not that many, but I've lost a few tanks. Turn five, I I finally basically clear up the remaining uh, World Eaters. They, they, they move block me a little bit more, but I'm, I start to drive through the channels. I get a few more points, but it's too little too late. And so despite the fact that by the end of turn five, I had essentially table the world eaters. I think there might have been like a rhino left. Maybe not even that. I lose the game on points. And the final score ends up being uh, 50 points to the guard and 80 points to Jack and the world eaters. Looking back on the game, I think that Jack played it perfectly. He was aggressive, but he never overcommitted and he judged perfectly how much would be needed to pin me in for just the right amount of turns so that he would be able to get that lead. So well placed Jack, you know, absolutely smashed it. Myself, I think I made two big mistakes. Firstly, the aforementioned rules mistake where I didn't realize that tanks couldn't scratch each other's back. That was big, that cost me a lot of mobility in turn two. And speaking of mobility, I should have used strategic reserves more. I should have seen that between the terrain and the army I was playing, anything that started on the board was going to get blocked in there. If I'd put three or four units in reserve, I might have been able to come in from various flanks, start hitting Jack with big guns from unexpected quarters, and it might have allowed me also to pick up a few more secondary points. But ifs and buts do not make a victory. But the good thing is that I did learn a lot from the game, and I always say you do learn more from your losses than from your victories. To be honest, the main thing that I was sad about with the loss was it was the end of the streak. A bit like O'Brien in that one episode of DS9, I had been in the zone, and not including using Scions, just with regular guard, I had gone 14 games undefeated. Not all of those are victories, in fact many of them were draws, but I had been on a bit of a hot streak. But unfortunately, with my mistakes, I did lose that game. And so didn't manage to get 15 wins in a row. But honestly, I can't be too sad about it. 14 games is incredible. Better than I've ever done before. Um, I do truly believe that guard is a bit of a sleeper right now. And uh, they have a lot of ways that they can play into the current meta. And when you look at the overall results... Um, with Scions and with regular guard, I have won 17 out of 20 competitive games. So there's not much for me to be sad about. Honestly, I'm not saying this just to wank myself off and to brag. I'm saying it because I do believe that guard is very powerful at the moment. Our army rule might be a bit poo. Our orders might be susceptible to 
Battleshock, but the core data sheets in the guard are really strong. And there are a lot of units out there that are very, very competitively priced. And I think that just gives us a real, a real solid feeling. We can go to most events and we can get into most battles and have a very high confidence in our units and in our ability to win. We're not going to win every game, but I think an efficient guard list built on those fundamentals of having a good core of infantry with a solid backup of tanks and seasoning with some artillery and having a few units that can go around and score stuff. I think if you take a really finely tuned, well-balanced guard list, I think that you could be comfortable and confident into going into a lot of tournaments and you'll probably you'll probably go 3 and 0 or 2 and 1 at a local RTT and even at like a big GT I think you you'd be able to go 4 and 1 fairly consistently. I don't think that guard are top top tier though. I think you know being honest looking at some of the matchups that I have had over the last um uh, 20 games I have sometimes been able to have quite quite a good match quite a lucky match for i've had a good mission against a certain opponent with a certain list and all this kind of stuff so i think that there has been an element of luck to that streak and i wouldn't deny that but i do still believe that guard are in a really solid place i think the only thing that's stopping them from being like a tier is there are some armies out there which have it all guard might have have good data sheets but there are some armies out there which have got good data sheets, good points, good army rules, and they've also got brilliant detachments as well. For me, the big thing is how guard fair as codexes start coming out. We know we're not getting our codex for probably a year or so from this point. Might not get one in 2024. And traditionally, guard can start an edition quite strong. But as more factions get their updated rules, we start falling down a bit. So I think 2024 is going to be the true test of the current guard index. But of course, all of this is just like my opinion, man. Let me know what you think down in the comments section below. And also, let me know what other kind of guard armies and armies for other factions you would like me to run at tournaments. We've very much been taking some meme lists recently with pure tanks and double super heavies and pure infantry. But if there's any other kind of guard army, be it more serious or more meme that you want me to hit the tournament scene with, get it down in that comment section. If you enjoyed today's video, please consider smashing that like button. It makes a huge difference. It feeds the almighty and unknowing algorithm. And if you want to see more tournament reports, don't forget to subscribe to never miss an episode. Would you like to know more? If so, then please consider becoming a channel member or patron. By supporting the channel, not only will you be doing your part, but you'll also be helping me create more content for your viewing pleasure and unlocking a whole host of perks. You get everything from a badge next to your name, custom emojis, but the big one is access to the Mordian Glory Discord server, an online community with almost two and a half thousand active members. It's always popping off in the MG Discord. We've got channels for army lists, hobbying, tactics, stories, and even a pretty spicy meme section as well. For all you greenhorns that wanted to see the Mordian glory hole, today is your lucky day. And joking aside, I do want to say a massive thank you to all of the current channel members and patrons. You guys are amazing. Truly the lifeblood of the channel. I could not do Mordian glory full time without the incredible and generous support of my members so thank you guys so much and last but certainly not least i want to say a personal thank you to all of my top tier patreons these are the war masters the people who have truly gone above and beyond the call of duty so a massive thank you to bon bon vert mad larkin mark panconi rj scorpion swordfish trombone john stubbs Nick Walsh, Diesel Fox, 
August Vardy and the Tommies. Thank you guys. Your incredible support makes a huge difference and it is a big part of how I'm able to do Mordian Glory full time. But that's all for now. Thank you for watching and of course, as always, I'll see you guys next time.